part of what we think we're doing is helping people just change their food environment. And I think that was the secret to what was happening all those years ago for the the plated customers was we made it so that the food that was around them was delicious and oh, by the way, healthy. And I think that's how people really think about it. I'm convinced that whether you're an Ironman or a person with uncontrolled diabetes, we all look at a menu and think, what looks good on you? Welcome back to the Fit Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Jovenary. Today, I'm joined by Josh Hicks, CEO of Season Health, a digital food pharmacy. In this episode, we discuss Josh's experience building the meal kit service, Plated, Season's approach to food as medicine, the company's recent $34 million funding round, and the growing need for solutions that target diet-related chronic illnesses. Let's get into it. Hi, Josh. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to today's conversation. Uh, I think you have not only an interesting background, but a, a very interesting approach to the, the problem that you all are trying to solve. So maybe just to kick things off, can you introduce yourself and tell us about Season Health? Sure. So I'm, I'm Josh, one of two founders, co-founder and CEO of Season Health. Uh, my past life was building Plated, one of the big... Uh, D2C meal kit businesses, which was acquired by Albertsons in 2017. We started that business really with a, an interest, a long-term interest in health, nutrition, fitness, something directionally that way, but it was only ever a consumer product with no explicit health design. So we were very excited when one of the insurance plans, one of the blues called us up and said, Hey, a bunch of patients are telling their doctors they accidentally got healthy by using this product and basically what's up we can't get people to change behavior on average no matter what we do and it's happening accidentally so we learned some stuff there that we never got to really do anything with so fast forward season health uh, my co-founder mustafa had been the founding cto at a large mental health care business we also have spent a lot of time with one of our primary advisors a woman named dr andrea feinberg who built the Geisinger Fresh Food Pharmacy, which is sort of the gold standard, if you will, for food as medicine programs in the healthcare, like true kind of you know enterprise healthcare space. So we launched the business about two years ago. And what we're really doing is trying to institutionalize nutrition into healthcare in a certain sense, but more sort of today or in the here and now, we're a software platform for clinicians to prescribe nutrition which has not been a thing that's really done all that sort of commonly or well today, we don't think. Uh, you know, kind of the, the standard is you get a little bit of like, go home, you know, eat less, move more, eat this, not that kind of stuff. Um, so software to let them sort of formally prescribe nutrition. And then for the patient, a consumer grade app to actually fulfill that prescription. So let the patient actually come to the dinner table as a consumer, tell us, what you like, what you don't, who you're eating with, what your budget is, what your you know, sort of time budget is, how often you want to cook, all these things that really matter for how we all choose what to eat. Put that together with the clinical piece and then you know, map it on top of the whole world, on top of your Uber Eats, your Instacart, your Walmart curbside delivery, you know, wherever you're buying food today, as long as it's digitally, which is most places, um, and will help the patient you know, make the right choices, make, make it easy for the choices to be good, uh, in part by helping them pay for the food, the, the insurance plans, helping them to do that. So that's what we're doing and glad to be here. Yeah. I think a lot of those pieces, right. Coming down to convenience, coming down to automating a lot of the things that are already happening. You mentioned from the delivery standpoint, and obviously kind of getting that buy-in from both the clinicians who are prescribing this and then the insurance companies who are paying for it. When you look at all of those pieces, and, and you kind of mentioned it, folks from the doctor's office are basically getting like, hey, maybe try to be a little bit healthier. Um, no real direction beyond that. Certainly no education or uh, support system as they're going through that process. Is it or has it been a hurdle to get that buy-in from the clinicians or from the insurers? And what have those conversations been like? I, I think it's less. 
the first thing I would say is we're about two years into this, which in healthcare time is about two seconds. So take all of this with a grain of salt. But my early, you know, my early observation would be it's more about aligning incentives than it is about getting buy-in. You know, I think the, the, the sort of good news about healthcare is, you know, by and large, people are in it for the right reasons. They're, they're in it because they care, because they want to help people, they want to make people healthier. That's all the, the backdrop. So it's not about, I don't think it's about buying. It's not about convincing doctors or, you know, the clinicians who it might be dietitians, et cetera, that eating healthier helps people. It's not about, you know, kind of convincing of that. It's about creating the environment that they can actually do that in, right? I mean, in a fee-for-service environment, your dietitian or whomever is running encounter to encounter to encounter. They don't, if there's not a reimbursement code for a tool like Season Health, they simply can't use it. They're also, you know, bombarded with a million digital health companies. It's just not a good setup. So for us, I think it's been more about creating value-based in some broad sense arrangements where, uh, you know, people have the, the right business model to do the things they already want to do, which is help people get healthier. And to this point, you mentioned, right, like two years in super early as it relates to anything healthcare. Uh, and oftentimes you're talking about getting that somebody else basically to pick up the tab it's got to be proven. There's got to be some type of, if not clinical study, some type of early indications that you're, you're proving this out. Uh, what have you done down that path to say like, hey, these incentives are aligned and it is working. So now let's continue to expand this. So we've done, we've done a couple of things. We are partnered with Geisinger. They are our anchor customer. So we're, we're essentially taking over the existing fresh food pharmacy operation there and helping to scale it up and out to more people and to more conditions. So we get the, the sort of benefit of all the years of work and research and outcomes that are there. So that, that helps a bit. Uh, we're also starting to do our own research. So the, the first and now announced clinical trial, we're, we're running with Common Spirit. So some of our own research and leaning on some of our partners uh, is the, the sort of early effort but I think the other, you know, more honest answer is we still do need to do a lot more. We're getting positive reactions from the, the early adopters, but some people just want to see our own primary research and we're, uh, we're working hard at that. Yeah, for sure. And, and to the initial point, like it takes time. And you mentioned and even expanding like the number of conditions or people that you're able to, you know, serve right now. How do you think about who that core customer is, that core patient is, are there specific conditions? Because you are, like you said, th there has to be the doctor involved. They are making the decision to essentially prescribe this. So who kind of falls into that bucket of a customer or patient? So we're live today serving patients with diabetes and with chronic kidney disease. The way that we're thinking about it is it's kind of the intersection of the, the people that need the help the most, which I think you know needs to be the the sort of highest priority. Those are also the people that are the most expensive to their insurance plan. So the insurance plan is the customer, right? I mean, this is the, uh, the sort of strange and weird world of healthcare. You have a customer and multiple users, and sometimes it's not clear who is who, but the insurance plan is the customer or whoever the risk-bearing entity is. And we're simply here to make people healthy. Uh, this, the, the downstream effect of that is that they are cheaper to insure and care for, which is what the plans care mostly about. So we're starting by serving patients that need the most because they need the most, they're the most expensive to the plans and those plans are willing to pay for care for them. So patients with diabetes uh, and or chronic kidney disease today, uh, and we'll have some new, new conditions, I think, to, to announce and new populations to serve shortly, but that's where we are now. Yeah. And then there's the, and that, that, that definitely all kind of makes sense and checks out when you think about just like the number of people impacted by chronic conditions and the uh, expense rate right, that then goes to the health insurance companies, but also the overall economy. And just like, if we get down to the basics of like, what can we do to help people improve 
basic aspects of health. Certainly food is at the center of that. So you start to then expand from there. Um, you mentioned having kind of learned through plated, right? That like people were getting in shape, they were losing weight, they were getting healthier. And, and maybe that wasn't the, the kind of core goal, or maybe you didn't get to ex explore that to its fullest extent. When you think about that on the kind of consumer side, right? Like the number of meal kits that cater towards keto or building muscle or losing weight or a plant-based diet. Now on the other side of that, it may be many of the same or similar kind of quote unquote diet plans or meal plans or ingredients. Why go this path now, this time around to healthcare? Instead of saying like, look, we get it. There's tons of people who are already fit and healthy who are going to spend a bunch more money on these kind of different meal plans and options. So where was the kind of decision point? And now kind of looking back on, it, are you thinking like, that was the right decision or you, you maybe kind of look and say like, how do we get into that consumer market? How are you thinking about how that continues to evolve? One day we will get back into that more consumer is not exactly the right word because there are some you know, consumer and, and you know, out of pocket patients today, but that more fit patient and consumer base, you know, we, we do have aspirations to, to sort of come back to that market eventually. But the, the decision, which I, I think is still the right one, at least as of now, and it's a, a, a crazy early stage, you know, high growth company. So ask me again in a month. But the decision has been to start again by serving the patients with the highest needs, right? I mean, you sort of said it for folks that I think in a lot of ways look like you and I, there are a ton of options, right? I mean, it's almost overwhelming how many food and supplements and exercise products and programs are out there for folks that are in a different socioeconomic status and a different life stage. There's not all these options. Uh, and, and the disease burden sadly is pretty correlated to that. So you, you look at the populations where they just don't have access to a lot of these things that you're talking about. And I think there's a much higher need. And from a business perspective, less competition in a certain kind of way. And we wanted to be a, a real healthcare business. You know, I think that sort of fit consumer is after a preventative solution, which is really important, but doesn't currently fit within the healthcare system. So we've chosen to start with the, the sort of highest risk you know, people, members with the, the highest need, and over time, work our way into the, the healthier population. Yeah, hugely, hugely important work. And I think about, to your point, that it's not even so much the what the, the market is or who's spending money or what the, even the competition is. It's so much, like you said, it's like, well, there aren't a lot of people focusing there and they don't have the same options or access um, or solutions that are catering to them. So that contributes to that problem continuing to get worse. So we kind of talked about you know, that prescription working with the doctors, working with the uh, kind of health insurance companies, what does it look like in terms of the experience, right? So that, you know, I get that prescription, the food kind of shows up at my house. Where does it go from there in terms of that support from the app or uh, how people, you know, follow through with any type of behavior change and that learning experience that's so important? You're meeting a dietitian at some point in this journey. It's, either a dietitian that works for Seasons Virtual Clinic or for whoever the sort of big hospital slash provider, capitated provider partner is. But from the patient experience, it, it almost doesn't matter in a certain way. So you meet this dietitian. And then there are two things, two big work streams that start. You, you know, sort of receive this prescription, which comes in the form of a, an email, right? Here's a, a link to this app, uh, web app or native, however you want to choose to engage, download it, log in and start your journey. And there, there, there are those two parallel paths. So one is clinical programming. You're seeing a dietitian, you're seeing a health coach, there's content, both culinary and health related, helping you to manage your condition, teaching you about, you know, what's happening at the, the sort of health level. And then in parallel is the food. So what you are shown is uh, a set of recommended options, both recipes and prepared meals. 
restaurant, et cetera. And you're given the choice. Part of what we think we're doing back to the, the plated story is helping people just change their food environment. And I think that was the secret to what was happening all those years ago for the, the plated customers was we just made, we made it so that the food that was around them was delicious and oh, by the way, healthy. And I think that's how people really think about it. I, I'm convinced that whether you're an Ironman or you know, a, a person with uncontrolled diabetes, we all look at a menu and think, what looks good on here? And maybe you choose to say, I'm not going to have that burger, even though it looks great because I'm trying to, you know, do whatever, but we all look at it and think the same thing. So we need to meet people where they are as people, as consumers, you know, food is a complex, emotional, cultural thing and show them options that are delicious and also healthy. And that's part of the, the sort of patient promise there is everything in here is going to be good for you. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to worry about the potassium levels for those kidney disease patients, whatever the right, you know, things are, you don't need to worry about it. it it's an autopilot kind of experience, not in that you don't get to choose, but then it, you know, that in all the choices are healthy. And so just pick whatever looks best to you and to your partner and your kids, whomever you're eating with, that, that's the, the, the sort of patient slash consumer experience. You kind of have this 12 week intervention of various forms of therapy, medical nutrition therapy, peer support, uh, some other clinical content and programming, and in parallel, the food. And then just curious, what's the kind of feedback loop like? Is that like a daily check-in? I'm kind of submitting did I eat that meal plan? Did I eat other things? Am I tracking any type of calories or metrics or, you know, measuring my food? Like, how do you guys uh, take that into the equation? So we're trying to not ask the patient to do anything that isn't absolutely necessary. Everyone's busy. Everyone's got too much on their minds. So in terms of the, the there's a couple of feedback loops there. One is for the, the clinician, right? The dietitian and the rest of the care team. They can see what the patient's ordering they can see the status of labs, how they're progressing on their measures of A1C for patients with diabetes and so on. For the patient, they're seeing their intended contact schedule, right? Your next dietitian visit is scheduled for three weeks from now. If you want to talk to somebody today on demand, here's how you do that, so on and so forth. But it's more you know, pull than push. What that schedule looks like is really up to the care teams. You know, part of what we're, what we're aiming to do is empower those people, the, the dietitians uh, and whoever else is sort of part of that care team. You know, we don't think that we have all the answers. We certainly don't think there's a one size fits all answer. We are, we are the platform that helps the clinicians care better for these patients and for the patients to actually take advantage of the care and the advice and so on. But the clinician should be driving exactly what that looks like. Yeah. And then uh, are they also, or part of this education or part of the overall uh, kind of intervention with that, whether it's dietitian or health coach, are there kind of like holistic health approach to that? Are they also talking about exercise? Are they also talking about sleep, mental health? Or at this point, it's primarily like, hey, let's focus on what you're eating, sticking to that meal plan. Uh, and maybe we'll tackle some of those other things down the road. A lot of clinicians, dietitians and so on, are talking about those topics with patients, but it's not something that season directly does today. So we're focused on food. It's one of the pillars, if not, you know, perhaps the most complex one, um, and where we think our, you know, our real sort of specialty is can't be all things to all people. There's lots of, uh, of interesting folks. Uh, you've had many of them you know, on here, lots of people listening who are focused on sleep and exercise. We're focused on the food. Certainly over time, I think we'll, we'll look to do real and better partnerships on those fronts. But the, the clinicians today use us as, again, one part of their sort of care programs. Um, you know, for many of these patients living with chronic disease, there, there's a whole host of things they need to do. There are actual medications, pharmaceutical prescriptions. There are clinical encounters if you end up on dialysis, you know, so on and so forth. So we're one part of it. We think we have a lot of you know, value to add to clinical outcomes and quality of life, but it is one part of a, a bigger care plan. Yeah, absolutely. And I was also, I was kind of asking that from the perspective of 
in general, oftentimes like healthy behavior changes a nudge or a slippery slope in a good way to other things. Like you start eating healthier, you start feeling better, you start being like, ah, I'm not sleeping too great. I'm not maybe as physically active. And uh, oftentimes when I've talked to other folks who have kind of similar interventions down one path, well, the, the user starts asking questions like, hey, what should I do about this? Or how can I do that? And it sounds like you, in this case, this is one tool in the toolbox uh, as you think about helping these people achieve that healthier lifestyle and maintain living with and, and dealing with some of the chronic conditions that they are. One of the things I did want to ask as well is to this point, uh, you mentioned kind of like two years and ramping this up. Do you talk about or is there any type of sense of how many people have been through this? What type of results you have seen thus far? Um, or even if it's metrics in terms of like how big is the team or, you know, the group that's working on this that is able to, you know, kind of drive it forward. Uh, and then I'll, I guess I'll kind of have a follow up based on that. There aren't a lot of metrics that we've talked about yet. I think it's still a little early. We want to be rigorous about the the clinical outcomes and so on. So all I would really say is overall, we've been happy with how patients are progressing through. Uh, we've only just launched the first of these big enterprise partnerships. So those are, those are fairly early and uh, we'll have more to talk about sometime later this year. Yeah. And then I was kind of asking that down the path of oftentimes it's, it's not a matter of you know, not knowing at least at a it kind of like a basic level, like these foods are not good for me. Um, and then oftentimes you have access can be a huge issue, especially depending on where you live, especially depending on socioeconomic status, um, you know, from food deserts to affordability to a whole host of issues. So that challenge is, is always kind of there, but then there's the, the food comes to my house, right. And I'm talking to my clinician, dietitian, health coach, and maybe I'm eating the healthy food, but I'm also eating the other snacks. I'm also, you know, maybe seasoning it in a way that's not super helpful in terms of what I'm trying to uh, achieve. How are you taking that into account? Just like the human element, right? Because it is, it's an emotional experience, uh, eating and food. It's a social experience. Um, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. And, and even people who are 100% healthy, I think there's all types of different like, you know, studies or cases where it's, you know, report what you ate today and people wildly <laughs> underestimate, you know, the number of calories or how big the servings were, all those things. Um, so just how do you take that into account? I think the biggest, the biggest thing I would say is we think, and, and certainly for the, the patients that we're serving, it's about what's happening on average and over time. It's not about what happened at any specific meal. We're certainly not asking them to log it. One, because it's, I think it's just too much. Nobody really wants to do that. Certainly nobody is doing that over an extended period of time. We know what's being ordered through the platform. We can make very reasonable guesses about what people are eating based on that. And we see the health outcomes. And, and this is one of the areas I think, one of the areas where I think you can see the difference between what you would need to do to, to serve that person who's you know trying to get their their carbs dialed into the gram because they're you know working on that Ironman training versus somebody who uh, for a variety of reasons is coming from a diet of a hundred percent processed and fast food. We don't need to get them. We would like for them to completely you know move off of that, but we don't actually need them to especially in the, in the immediate term, it can be a gradual thing. You will see clinical results from any movement away from that diet. So it, it's more about, you know, helping them to understand what's happening, helping them to change their environments, right? The food that's around them, making it easy for there to be better food around them and eat better some of the time. Ideally one day it's all of the time, but Let's be real. Very few of us eat well all of the time. <laughs> Certainly some of my weekend meals would be, you know, things I wouldn't uh, want to publicize. So it really is about that, that. It's about on average over time, let's improve the average quality, not some hard shift away from, oh, maybe they seasoned a little more or they're, you know, still having, you know, more of this food that we'd like them to avoid here and there. If we're impacting, you know, a reasonable percentage of the meals 
the research would say we can help uh, improve health outcomes. For sure. Yeah. So uh, thinking about, you know, you mentioned launching and uh, doing one of the first bigger partnerships, right? So that's, that's fairly new. Also, you know, two years into it in general, but also I, I think maybe it was earlier this year that like officially emerged from stealth and you have some type of uh, clinical studies you mentioned uh, in the works and planning on doing more of your own research. So a, a lot going on, right? No shortage of things in terms of continuing to drive forward. But when you look at the roadmap, maybe even over the back half of the year, what are the priorities that stand out to you that say like, these are the benchmarks we're pressing towards as a team that really get us in a position now where we can, whether it's continue to expand or roll out the services more broadly and just continue to make progress going forward. Yeah. So for context, we literally announced these partnerships 12 weeks ago. It was early to mid February. It feels, uh, feels to me like many years as well, but uh, we just announced those first big customers. And uh, just more recently started onboarding those patients. So I think the back half of this year for us is really about focus on our existing partners. We owe that to them. Onboarding the right patients, delivering outcomes for them. And secondarily, exploring you know, new customer relationships and new disease states. So it's, it's really about, I think, getting to those first sets of outcomes right now you know, through serving these first partners. And then when you think about if we were to like zoom out a little bit and think about the various approaches or I don't necessarily want to even call them trends because a lot of them are kind of proven interventions, but from prescription weight loss drugs, obviously kind of gaining traction with that, like digital weight loss platforms, uh, obviously coaching, some of it's digital, AI, text, some of it's like actual humans, health coaches. Um, so you have all these different things. Uh, maybe I'll even throw in there like uh, wearables, wearables from activity trackers all the way to like glucose monitoring. In the case of diabetes, that's very much essential. In the case of more kind of health optimization, it's just another kind of tool in the in the health optimization toolbox there. Uh, do you think about or how do you think about where season health is trying to fit in there? Because it is like in in one sense, the, the weight loss approach right now, talking about this and going and getting a prescription and doing the telehealth and involving, you know, different uh, clinicians and health coaches is kind of like, hey, let's back into it, right? Let's deal with it where it is now and try to lose this weight. And this approach is like, let's fundamentally change what we're eating and introduce these healthy behaviors and start to tackle it that way. Um, so just how are you thinking about all of these trends? And they're all kind of like uh, very much uh, gaining steam at the same time. First off, it's exciting that they are. You know, I'm, I'm relatively new to healthcare, but a thing I hear commonly is there's more change happening right now than you know at any time anybody currently working in this industry can remember, which is which is exciting. I think you know it's it's needed, and there's a lot of good stuff going on. So what I would say is, I think one, all of these solutions in some form are, are needed, and I think you know it, it's a, maybe a a little silly or obvious, but we just need more technology generally. And, and not because you know technology is the answer in a vacuum and not because it's replacing people or anything like that, but because there's not enough people. There's a severe shortage of you know healthcare workers, first off, right? We have this, sort of this terrible trio of a shortage of healthcare workers and not enough healthcare access for the population, for Americans, and too high of costs. I don't see any way out of that other than to build better tools that help people scale their own work, specifically I mean, the healthcare workers, clinicians I'm, I'm talking about. So helping them to have better day-to-day -day work lives, many of them are experiencing huge amounts of burnout. So let's build tools that help the healthcare workers that are currently working, hopefully, you know, help sort of change the paradigm so that uh, more people want to pursue those kinds of careers, which will also have the effect of bringing down costs without losing any jobs because there's such a severe shortage uh, and improving the patient experience. I, I mean, it's, you know, I certainly don't mean to say that there's any silver bullet here, but, you know, building better 
experiences for everyone involved in the system, I think has got to be a big part of the solution here. So not to mention that, you know, most of the cost and most of the problems come from, you know, so-called lifestyle diseases today. And those things need to be addressed in a different way than the, the acute system that's been built. So, you know, we're still figuring out where we think our, our you know, best and highest use is in that, but uh, certainly, hopefully, it's in the food as medicine you know, end of the spectrum, which I would, I would distinguish from you know, the weight loss companies. They're, they're doing important work, but you know, we're focused on, again, diabetes and, and kidney disease today which are certainly, you know, somewhat related to, uh, you know, obesity, but not entirely. And down the road, some of the conditions that we're exploring certain forms of cancer, not all, but certain tumor sites are very nutritionally responsive. Maternity uh, in the form of gestational diabetes and uh, the avoidance of low birth weight infants, very nutritionally responsive. Heart failure, hypertension, um, and, you know, sort of cardiac related conditions are very nutritionally responsive. So, you know, there, there's a, at least a short list of chronic diseases that are very nutritionally responsive that I think are different in nature. So somewhere in that space, we think we have a lot of value to add through helping patients, delivering outcomes. It will almost certainly involve partnerships with many of those companies and integrations across the newly sort of emerging ecosystem of remote patient monitoring or wearables, or, you know, I think a lot of this is the language the business models haven't even been fully sorted out, but, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's an exciting time for sure. And there's a lot going on. Yeah. I think, uh, that was well said. And just to, you know, tie a ribbon around it, it's, um, hugely important and much needed just in terms of the scale of the problem. So it's almost like uh, all of the above, right? It's, it's all of the above. There's all these different kind of solutions and platforms potential. We need all of them, many of them, probably more of them to your point with more technology. What's happening now is not working. I, I think that's, you know, there, there's very few things that are clear as far as I can tell, but clearly what we are all doing right now isn't enough. Costs continue to go up. The rates of chronic disease continue to go up. None of it's sustainable. All of our Medicare, Medicaid are trending towards insolvency. You know, th these are big, big problems. Not, not to mention the, the very important just cost of human life and quality of life and the, the sort of quality and quantity of years of life. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on, but uh, we all need more. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just kind of say to that, like, I also wrestle with, and the last question before we get you out of here, wrestle with and conflicted about like continuing to make things more complex, add more layers, add more technology, add more solutions, um, but also just how simple, right? The problem is at the root of it and how we, you know, continue to deal with that because it's like, we are throwing so much at it. it. It's not working, but what do we need more of, right? I guess is the question. So being thoughtful about those solutions. Um, and I think you're approaching it in a way where it is kind of simple, right? And, you know, more uh, elegant in terms of how you're packaging it and delivering that access. But uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts down that path of like making it more complicated when I think we need simpler solutions for people. I, I totally agree. You know, and we, we certainly don't have all the answers. We are still figuring out many, many things, including some fundamental stuff, you know, things about our business. But I would say if we're making things more complicated, we're failing. You know, we need for things to be simpler for everybody, for clinicians, for payers, for patients, really for everybody. It is the whole industry is wildly complex, as you described with many layers. And it, it is pretty wild. I, I think... You know, first off, there's a lot of business model and regulatory changes that need to happen and, and are happening, right? I mean, certainly the, the kind of big broad umbrella of value-based care is one of them. There's lots of complexity in there and lots that needs to be figured out, but certainly, you know, making it simpler for doctors to do what they think is best to make you healthier is, I think, the headline. The technology, I think, has a role to play in making all of that more seamless, right? Like there's already technology in the system. It just 
pagers and fax machines. I mean, seriously, like those are the tools of the trade today. Regardless, there are problems with any example, but if you look at, pick your favorite, Amazon, I can open my phone, I can use the app, and I can have basically anything delivered tomorrow. And not that there aren't some externalities created there, but from a simplicity perspective, that is amazingly simple. And it's software that is obscuring the complexity underneath. And I think that is one frame of reference for how we've thought about healthcare. All of this complexity, I got to fill out this form and triplicate and figure out if I have this insurance or that, and is it covered? All of that needs to be automated. And there's a lot of people working on that stuff. So no silver bullets, but at least uh, lots of good stuff happening. Yeah, as an industry, a, a long way to go. And of, of course, that creates a lot of need and opportunity and season being early in your journey. So as that continues to evolve, we'll definitely be following along. But yeah, just in wrapping up, where would you point people to to learn more, to keep tabs on what you're working on? What's the best place? Seasonhealth.com. That's uh, probably the best way. And we're working on uh, better ways to engage for, for the healthier folks out there and uh, more more content and so on. But um that's, uh, that's the best place for now. Yeah, I, I hope folks check it out. And thanks so much for making a few minutes today, Josh. Yeah, thank you, Joe.